Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in San Francisco. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, here with Savannah Peterson. She and I, Rob Streche, and the entire CUBE team is here. We got Anand, he's a friend of theCUBE, Senior Director of Technology at ICE. ICE is the parent company of the New York Stock Exchange. Anand, great to see you, thanks for coming on Thank theCUBE. Thank you, happy to be here. Um, so we've known each other for a while, and um, it's first time on theCUBE, welcome with me. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Talk about your background, because you have a, you told me you built a lot of stuff at the NYSE. Yeah. A lot of the systems, a lot of the code, that power of the exchange. ICE has a lot more going on than just the NYSE. It's yeah. a lot of things going on in the systems there. You just started the AI Center of Excellence yeah. at ICE yeah. that you're running. Yeah. And it's got a lot of action going on. So take us through what you've been building in the past and what is the AI Center of Excellence? Yeah. Um, I started my journey as a technologist more than two decades ago, uh, back in India, worked there for five years, moved to the States uh, as part of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, I was part of the matching engine uh, development team. Uh, but the interest has always been how the system works at the lowest level, uh, try to understand everything, how to optimize, and that plays a role uh, in the story uh, leading up to the AI. Uh, worked my way up, building many of the system that uh, powers the New York Stock Exchange, uh, played a pivotal role in rebuilding the system, uh, have been part of the pillar development platform or trading platform that powers all our uh, exchanges at New York Stock Exchange, uh, as well as market data systems, uh, truly a world-class, sophisticated, distributed computing system at a lowest latency, you know, um, and we use InfiniBand, which is basically used at, in AI, you know, training. So we understand a thing or two about low latency, high volume usage. I also uh, led the team to build the first hybrid cloud infrastructure and application for NYC. Uh, so I built a system for NYC surveillance for the regulators. Uh, we mine data for 650 billion transactions every single day to find patterns. Uh, once I finish how that, many How many um, signals per day? 650 billion. Billion with a B. B. At, That's a lot. at, at microsecond level latency. Uh, that means that you have ton of dense nanosecond granularity data and you have to find patterns uh, in the data set to figure out who is trying to game the market, you know. So and there's a lot of vectors involved, a lot of embeddings, a lot of math. Or so the embedding and math, so math definitely is, is the core of all these things, right? But embedding comes later on. Okay, uh, Pigeon, I didn't mean interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we'll come to that. So basically, uh, uh, once we finished all the data mining and you know, we didn't have the day-to-day -day operational challenges uh, after the cloud migration, we started focusing on machine learning, you know. Um, so we build our deep learning models and things like that for the time series data. And then chat GPT happened, everybody pivoted towards transformer models. So we build a uh, new sentiment analysis to correlate with the, with the uh, regulatory data or surveillance output that is coming out to figure out how we can auto-resolve uh, some of the alerts. That's where vector database comes into picture, combination of multiple models, there is a pipeline and, and things like that. Uh, but then fast forward right now, I, I moved to lead the AI center of excellence for our parent company uh, to increase our collaboration across the company, observability, you know, there are similar use cases, how do we build it right, make sure we have the accuracy, explainability, and all the things that goes without saying in our world. Um, so that's that's my journey. Awesome. So, well, congratulations, fascinating. And I'm, I can't wait to get into the weeds on some of the questions because there's a lot of data. Real time has been a big part of what you're doing. Yeah. We didn't kind of, we haven't heard a lot from Molly and the Databricks team about real time yet. Yeah. You know, they have to deal with real time. They're doing more, they're doing more like solve the big lake problem first, yeah. but real time matters in, in AI. Can you share your opinion on, and commentary on why real time is so important? I mean, you deal with it every day, it's in your DNA, in your bloodstream, that ICE, but mainstream enterprises now are going to be dealing with real-time data. Yes. How is that going to change the game? Oh, it's a, it's a big thing. So I, I was explaining someone last week how the low latency comes into picture. So let's say you type something for a search uh, and, and the response takes 10 seconds to come back, you would give up on that search engine, right? So 
the, the there is a latency of 10 seconds in that case, right? So you have to improve every step of the way so that it it, it is faster. Now you, to your question about real time, when things are happening around the same time, you need the information around that, right? So human surveillance is one big use case. As soon as something is happening, if you can correlate the data and find patterns, you know, uh, that's of immense value, you know. So uh, the time to act on something that is happening with human surveillance uh, is a big, big thing, you know, for any real time use cases that is there out there in the in the yeah. world. Yeah, and, 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 uh, yeah, and the way to way to think about this is that uh, so LLMs cannot be a sledgehammer, right? So you have to build purpose purpose built models, you know, small language model or classification model, deep learning model to figure out how to use all these things as modules, you know, rather than you know thinking that chat GPT will solve all the problems, you know. So yeah. So when people say neural network, yeah. okay, the AI is a neural network, knowledge graphs. I mean, a knowledge graph is a knowledge graph, we know what that is. But neural network has kind of, I won't say the term's been abused, it might have been misused a lot. What is a neural network in context to AI? Can you simply explain what that is? Okay, is so. It, is it a format, is it a database, is it graphs, is it like math instead of keywords? I mean, neural network, is it, a, is it essentially a, an actually instrumented node in a graph, what, what is a neural network? Okay, so uh, let me let me dump it down. So we know about human brains and, and neurons, right, basically. So let's say uh, you have a picture of number nine mm -hmm. and you f are saying that this model can understand that this letter that you have scribbled is actually nine. So what happens is that each of the neurons, which is essentially making a decision whether a pixel fits in that number nine, let's say there is a 28 by 28 pixel, you know, number nine, and you lay that in a flat uh, neuron, you know, in the first layer, each of the pixel will make a decision. So think neuron as a number between zero and one, and the activation is there for that neuron to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So that creates your first layer of neural network. And the last layer of neural network would basically tell us whether that is number nine. And in between that, there are multiple layers which are there. Then each of these layer basically route for the next layer, you know, and that becomes your weights, right? So uh, essentially it's a thing in memory which is storing a number between zero and one. You know, that's yeah. how I would like to s yeah. simplify it. And so it allows you to do things much faster Take that six billion signals. 650 six billion signals. Six, yeah. uh, 650 billion. Sorry, yeah. I missed a few zeros <laughs> on that one. But that's a, lar a lot of large data, so neural yeah. network allows you to do things faster, right? Yeah. Is that the way to so think about I, it? I, I don't think uh, um, neural net would get to a level where we can, at least not at this day and age, yeah. can do the real time 650 billion transaction inference wise. Uh, like Ali said today, you know, inference is the thing, you know, training is one part of the problem, but the main use case is inference, right? Uh, the way low latency or any of these high volume transactions work, and the way neural network, you know, there are completely different use cases for that, yeah. but you can always find patterns in the data which yeah. can make into the neural net to make yeah. some decision or some output. Yeah, it's just, it's, an, it's just another way to deal with information. Information, In yeah. this way, it's not semantic or keyword. The yeah. number nine is actually not a number in the mind of the, the neural yeah. net. It just becomes nine because of the, the yeah. brain figures it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or the neurons, you said. All right, All right so let's get to the uh, ICE situation. Mm -hmm. ICE is the parent company of NYSE. You're running the AI Center of Excellence. What is that organization? Is it like a, a think tank? Is, are you building stuff? Do you bring customers in? Um, do you interrogate people and find out what they want to buy? I mean, what do you do there? Tell, take us through, I'm only kidding in the last part, yes. but you know, <laughs> what, what is the AI center of excellence? So think uh, this, as, as the name suggests, it is a center for excellence. <laughs> so what does it mean is that, let's say there are various use cases, how do we make sure that we implement the AI use cases properly so that each of the process is followed so that we get some value addition, first of all, and it is implemented the right way. And the way to think about it is that is each of the 
process in data validation, data governance, uh, AI model governance, distribution, and all the training exercise that is there and yeah. all the bells and whistles that is needed is covered. That's one thing. The other thing is having a strategic vision in the company to you know, lay out the foundation so that multiple AI applications or projects can run with the same vision uh, is the key for the center of excellence. So it's an internal R&D group. So, uh, we so are your stakeholders are inside the company right now. Yes. Any external customers or just all internal for now? Or so, so basically whatever, whatever our idea is to empower the product and application delivery team Got for it. their AI use cases. Uh, I don't think we will go to a level where we will directly interface with the external customer. But think like, let's say, oh, you need to build something which is AI application related and you are getting started from scratch, you don't have any idea, so they would end up in this group, collaborate yeah. with us, you know, bring their it's idea. It's kind of incubation meets R&D meets commercializing a new idea. It's kind of like guardrails for, versus, I, mean, I see some organizations where, you know, there's a big, uh, you know, elbowing each other out for who's going to be the AI czar, right? right? I'm in charge of AI, no. Everyone either gets their own AI or there's yeah. a, a point person leading a group to yeah. understand it, build guardrails, yeah. lead so, innovation. Correct. So basically, uh, it is innovating without compromising on the first principle, right? Uh, and, and each of the team have the liberty to build their own thing. The only thing is that if they need any help, and they, some, some teams would be further along, right? So yeah. let's say you know, we have built our model, but in that case, are we following all the processes which are needed? AI regulation is one thing that is fast evolving. You know, you would see a news about AI regulation every every single day. So we, our job is to make sure that everything is implemented yep. by the book. Uh, you know, and we are a highly regulated industry. Accuracy, explainability, observability, all these things matter a lot. Um, so as part of my previous role, we had built many of these things. You know, so. The idea is to take that knowledge forward, and because I have enterprise application uh, delivery experience, you know, so combination of both those factors matters, you know. Uh, great. That, yeah. So great leadership opportunity to lead and help the organization. What are you building now? How do you look at the market? Because ICE obviously has a lot of data. You, have, you work with external data suppliers as well. Obviously, yeah. you're an exchange. Yeah. Um, we hear a lot about LLM being worried about privacy leakages, intellectual property. So people are building their own private models, especially mo or small language models or mm -hmm. small foundation models, yeah. and then connecting them to others. Mm -hmm. um, Bloomberg was reported last week when we were in New York uh, at the AWS Financial Symposium. I mean, I'm, apparently it was said publicly, so it's not like it's a secret. The head of AI there said, we did chat G uh, Bloomberg GPT, they were proud that they did it, but they actually ended up rewriting it because they actually went over their skis a little bit. Yeah. Um, and by the way, they, didn't, they don't mind. That's what they knew that that might happen because they yeah. were first. Yeah. Everyone's bloody through the wall first, right? First one through the wall gets cut up. So he said was, look, we don't have to reinvent a lot of stuff we can leverage from other models. Yeah. And his point was, we did all that, we learned a lot, but we actually learned that we don't need to do all that stuff. Yeah. What do you, what's your position on this? And how do you think about that from a first principle standpoint and or just from an industry perspective? You, sometimes you don't know what you don't know, but sometimes some things are clear as day. Why build it if you don't have to? And is it in your core competency? Yeah. What's your thoughts on this? So, uh, yesterday I had a meeting with uh, Chief Scientist of Mosaic ML, Jonathan and his vision and my vision resonated uh, because he said that start small, you know, and then understand the entire process. Uh, and if you have not started the journey, start with something, you know, very small, so that uh, before burning your finger, you know, you, you, you will uh, yeah. learn, learn about that. <laughs> so we have, we have done all those things, we have done fine tuning, we have used a uh, foundation model and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the idea is that before even you go and start thinking about building your foundation model, there are so many open source models out there uh, which can be fine-tuned. Uh, we have built small language model based on transformer architecture ourselves, you know, so it's, it's, uh, uh, it's nothing new uh, that is happening, but we are further along. Uh, that's what you I are have. building your own model. We did, we did build our own model for uh, news data analysis. 
and uh, that can run on a GPU, it's uh, BERT based architecture, which is basically the first generation of transformer model. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the idea was that how do we optimize the cost, you know. We always have uh, some constraint, you know, and, and uh, the innovation comes from the constraints, basically. So, my vision is that, or my view is that, do it, do it properly, start at a smaller scale, learn your way up before start thinking about investing ton of money. So I just checked my perplexity query about what a frontier model is, because we were talking before we came on camera, what's a frontier model, what's a foundation, all these different names. A frontier model is one that's ahead of the pack in, in performance. Okay, um, good to know. Larger than the la other large language models, so it's okay. the leader, basically. Um, you mentioned Bird, and, the, and this leaderboard's now coming out, so I want to ask you about this idea of leaderboards and um, the race. You know, Ali showed on stage, that, okay, open source is catching up meaning to the proprietary models, which they don't like to be called proprietary because OpenAI and Anthropic, it's their language model. Yeah. It's technically proprietary. Yeah. Um, but we could all use it. What's your feeling on this? Do they merge together? Are, are, are there situational situations for each one that work well? Will open source surpass? Will it flip around? Will they make coexist? What's your thinking on this one? What's your opinion? So my opinion is that we need to have control over our data and assets end to end, you know. Um, some, many of the cases open source model would work for the kind of use cases we have right now. For some of them it may not work and you have to go with the enterprise solution, maybe open AI uh, and, and, you know, Anthropic on AWS and things like that. But in those cases we make sure that we have coverage for data privacy and our CyberSec team, they validate the entire pipeline to make sure. And also, we under, I mean, we have to have agreement with them that they don't use yeah. our data for training the model further. So those kind of things are, are the first principle, in my opinion, for any of the things, you know. What's, you know, what's the coolest thing you're working on right now? <laughs> my, I mean, every day is, <laughs> is a fun day for me. I'm a hardcore technologist, so when I was building the low latency platform, uh, you know, I was, I was very excited. Uh, now it's kind of a similar thing, you know, how can we scale any of the things, so I love technology, I, I you know, love to... What's the most exciting thing that gets you um, excited? The fact that it's unknown ter territory, that it's changing so fast, or is there a specific, like, root level challenge or problem to solve? Yeah, look, uh, all, all of the above, but basically, not so much about how things are changing fast, uh, but how things work, how do we make sure that we are building the cost-effective solution? Mm -hmm. uh, because we need to have the right infrastructure, right tooling around it. So that's my main focus right now that keeps me up at night, you know, to think about the solutions. Yeah. Final question for you. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned regulated industries, yeah. explainable AI, whatnot. What, what's the, ch the main challenge uh, around um, regulation and or the pressure for regulated industries with AI. What's the, what are the main challenges? And, and you know, I mean, explainability means, yeah. explain, is what, what's behind that? What are some of the challenges that you see when you guys are in living it? So, first of all, we need to understand where AI is being used, right? Is it being used for, like, is large language model used for making pricing decision? That will be a strict no from our side, right? So. We don't use for our critical mass of trading and decision making and things like that. Where we use is productivity improvement use cases, right? So where you can improve the productivity kind of thing. The other thing is, are we doing everything by the book? Do we have audit trail? Do we have observability? Do we have monitoring? Uh, did we validate the accuracy of it? Uh, you know, all those kind of things. So that that is of paramount importance for us, you know. You know, we were at a, you guys hosted a really great event uh, in Silicon Valley, and I was talking to some of the technologists, Andy Betzelstein and others that I've known for years, and I asked all the puns that have been through multiple waves of innovation, what about this wave? And they're like, oh, it's going to be productivity right out of the gate. And the comment was, it was like email. Email and office suite was a, like, a, like an instant step function change from what it was before. Yeah. Um, and he said, that, and then it's going to probably go into some sort of more programmatic agents, and then ultimately some intelligence, but he, think, he thinks it's definitely going to be the low hanging fruit now on productivity, similar to what email did in like say, word processing and spreadsheets. Because 
the alternative was manual, yeah. and now it's magic right, yeah. compared to what it yeah. was. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I mean, that and also you have to think about what are the things you do manually, like you, know, you go to perplexity and then search for something, it gives information. So if you take that example and uh, apply that in various other workflow use cases, that can be automated. Yeah. Uh, it can give uh, better results. You know, so uh, you know there are there are a lot of use cases like that, which still, in my opinion, can be improved by a lot. You know. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming on the cube. Great thank to you. see you. Thank you for having me. Hardcore technologist on the cube. That's we love it. Deep dives. That's our format. The cube is live here on the show floor at DataBricks AI and Data Conference. I'm John Furrier, the host of the cube with Savannah Peterson here, Rob Stretch, George Gilbert, the entire Silicon Valley team coverage. We'll be back with more after this short break.